So I'd like to welcome all of you very much to our event on After Brexit, After Trump, uh, Germany at the Polls 2017. Thank you very much for coming. I extend that invitation to the students of Germany and the world, but particularly to the members of the community who've joined us tonight. I'm Glenn Erstein, Associate Professor in the Department of German. And we were here to discuss yesterday's parliamentary election in Germany. By now, most of you will have heard the results of yesterday's parliamentary elections. And I'll just run through the results, try and give you a brief overview of their historical significance, and then I'll uh, introduce our speakers. The results. CDU CSU, 33.0%. The SPD, 20.5%. That represents a historic low since 1949. The AFD, or the alternative for Deutschland, most of you have now heard about this party, it's brand new, 12.6%. Uh, the FDP, or the Liberals, 10.7%. The Left, uh, also at least uh, half of the party, the former Communist Party in East Germany, 9.2%. And then the Greens, 8.9%. There are some also some other parties that together pulled about 5.1% of the uh, votes. So Angela Merkel will remain chancellor, but otherwise, the election has left the German political landscape fractured as never before. Six nationally represented parties will hold seats simultaneously in Germany's parliament, the Bundestag, a first for post-war German democracy. The Social Democrats, Angela Merkel's partner in the grand coalition that has governed the country for over the last four years, are nursing their wounds following the party's worst showing ever since 1949. And the party has announced its intention to return to an opposition role in parliament. Without the SPD, the CDU-CSU fraction will have to cobble together a three-party coalition in order to lead a majority government. The most likely scenario, you've probably heard this by now, is the so-called Jamaica coalition, reflecting the three colors of the Jamaican flag. And the students in Germany, uh, in the world know that each German party has a particular color. So black for the CDU-CSU, yellow for the FDP, or the Free Democratic Party, and green for, you guessed it, the Greens. Most settling, unsettling, of course, is the sudden rise of the Alternative for Germany, or AFD. What began just four and a half years ago as an alliance of economists and academic elites against the German government's response to the Eurozone crisis has morphed into a populist protest party, fueled by xenophobic fears following Germany's adoption of over a million refugees from Syria and other war-torn regions of the Middle East since, 19, since 2015. The AFD is now the third largest party in the Bundestag after the CDU, CSU, and the SPD. And it's the first time since the founding of the Federal Republic of Germany in 1949 that a far-right party reminiscent of Hitler's National Socialists has entered parliament. Other European nations have long struggled with ultra-conservatives in their midst, but Germany, until now, seemed to have been immune. Uh, having learned the lessons and taken to heart uh, the lessons of World War II and tried to correct course after the Weimar Republic. This seems to represent an uh, unraveling of the um, post-war consensus regarding multilateral institutions, the important of importance of European integration, uh, and other um, certain standards that we've taken for granted for a long time. Um, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's event. This event would not be possible without the support of numerous entities on and off campus. Thank you to the UI Department of German and International <coughs> Programs for their financial support. And thank you as well to the Iowa City Public Library, which has been a generous community co-sponsor, allowing us to reach an interested audience off campus, not just through its hosting of the panel, but also through its offer to videotape today's event for later webcasting via the I ICPL library channel. We have also received generous support from the German Embassy in Washington, D.C. through its so-called Campus Weeks initiative. The embassy is supporting events such as this throughout the United States on campus, uh, and um, this has come with some uh, financial funding. This has allowed us to bring Consul General Quella to Iowa City from Chicago. Um, this includes the posters that you see in the back. And above all, this uh, involves uh, and includes some promotional material that the embassy has provided us to um, support interest in Germany. 
Um, following the presentations, we'll have a Q&A section. And at that point, I'll uh, direct your attention to the back table where my colleague Bruce Nottingham Spencer will be able to show you some of the items that we have. And anyone who asks a question is eligible to uh, pick, take your pick of some of the items we have there. And now to the most important part of, our, of the event, our three panelists. Habert Quelle has been serving as Consul General of the Federal Republic of Germany in Chicago since 2014. He has held diplomatic posts in countries across the world, including South Africa, Cuba, Poland, Azerbaijan, and Great Britain. It was my pleasure to first meet the Consul General last October when he delivered the opening remarks for the 2016 Obermann Humanities Symposium on German Iowa and the Global Midwest, and he kindly traveled to Des Moines last April to help us open the four-week run of our traveling exhibit on German immigration to Iowa at the State Historical Museum joining the French Consul General there to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the U.S. entry into World War I. We thank the Consul General for his continued support of German studies at the University of Iowa and are delighted to welcome him back to campus. Gerhard Löwenberg, our second panelist, is Professor Emeritus of Political Science and a specialist on European legislatures. He is, among other things, our campus expert on the German Parliament and has spoken before the German Parliament, I believe, soon after reunification. He is director of the Comparative Legislative Research Center and publisher of Legislative Studies Quarterly. And he is also a recipient of the American Political Science Association's Frank J. Goodnow Award for Distinguished Service and is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Last but certainly not least, Luis Martin Estudio is associate professor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. He is the managing editor of Hispanic Issues, both online and in print. Do I understand it correctly? Yeah. And um, he has received support from the NEH, uh, NEH for his uh, most recent book project, The Rise of Euroskepticism, Europe and Its Critics in Spanish Culture. And uh, this, of course, allows uh, Professor Martin Estudio to speak to uh, the issues of the German um, election from elsewhere in the EU. So these are our three panelists. Please join me in welcoming them. And then uh, we'd also like to take this opportunity to present Herbert Quella with a, a small token of our esteem for his time here on campus. I'm Downing Thomas. I'm Associate Provost and Dean of International Programs. Welcome. And I want to make a particular pitch to welcome uh, Consul General Quella. Uh, thank you for coming back to Iowa. And I'll point out that our tiger hawk has two of the three colors. You don't get green, but uh, <laughs> they can't have everything from the coalition. So thank you for coming. Provost Glenn, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, it's great to see so many interested in this uh, topic. Um, I've been given uh, five minutes, and I uh, will limit myself. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll need six minutes, because I would appreciate also the discussion that has been announced. And we have uh, th uh, two other eminent people on the panel. And I'm very happy to meet for the first time with Professor Emeritus uh, Löwenberg here and uh, Luis Encantado de Conocerle. Um, so uh, I spoke uh, last week um, uh, on a speculative, uh, of, with, with a speculative nature, of course, uh, uh, in Cincinnati. Uh, I gave four talks, and I had separated my uh, talk in, in two blocks. Uh, one, the speculative element, what will happen on, or might happen on Sunday, and what will then follow, and a descriptive block, uh, because the headline was the importance of these elections for Europe and the world. And I will give you a few elements of the first uh, firm block to just uh, uh, make it more understandable why this is of concern to all of us and why it's uh, good that you have shown up here and will go out hopefully with some more detailed knowledge about uh, uh, Germany and uh, the importance of these e elections. So uh, Germany is the fourth largest uh, country in the European Union after France, uh, Spain and uh, 
not many people know that, but it's, it's Sweden. Um, and it is the most populous of the EU member states with about uh, 82 million. More than 20% of our population today have a migration background. And that is important to memorize uh, when we uh, talk about the phenomenon of the xenophobic AFD uh, coming into Parliament. Of these, 20% uh, 9.2 million, and I guess it's more these days because these uh, data are from uh, two, two or three years ago. 9.2 million immigrants have a German passport and over 8 million are uh, foreigners. We maintain diplomatic relations with 195 uh, countries and we are uh, very much um, integrated in the uh, global uh, economy. We are embedded in the European uh, Union. Uh, the European Union engagement of Germany enjoys uh, despite the success of the AFD, which reached 13%, all your uh, figures were accurate. Uh, you must have gotten them from the same source that I uh, got them from. 13% uh, 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 are roughly, uh, it appears to be the people who have some objections to uh, our role in the European uh, Union. I would argue the majority of the German population uh, are in full support of us being a staunch member of the European Union, which has many reasons, um, historical uh, not being the least. Germany is the largest economy in the European Union and the economic powerhouse of the Eurozone, uh, and it regularly places among the three largest exporters with China and the United States. We are benefiting most from globalization. Why do I stress this next to the point that we have a large migration element in Germany? Because that is another element what is, which should, if, if there were rational thinking within the AFD voters, something that should uh, oblige them not to vote for the AFD because we cannot, uh, as a country that is benefiting so much from globalization, say, well, we should be more nationalistic than uh, we are. Um, every second euro that is earned in Germany is generated through an international business transaction. Almost one job in four is dependent on exports. In industry, it is even one uh, in two. Manufacturing in Germany still has a share of over 20% of the GDP, which is far higher than in uh, the US. Let me uh, leave it at that, and let me come to the outlook on what will happen now. Uh, Glenn, you said correctly that the only option for Angela Merkel after the result of the elections yesterday is to search for a coalition with the Free uh, Democrats which I'm hesitant to call uh, liberals, because liberal in the American uh, sense means leaning to the left, which they are clearly not. They are free marketeers. You might, might rather call them libertarian, uh, I would say, than, uh, than uh, a liberal. Um, in German, that for those of you, there are a couple of German students here and German speakers. You know very well, liberale means something very different from what liberal means in the American uh, context. So uh, the option to go with the FDP and with the Greens. Uh, there is some known element in that and there's some unknown element in that. The known element is that both parties that are coalition parties, partners for Angela Merkel and the CDU, CSU, this faction from between uh, her Christian Democratic Union, of which she is the chairman, and her sister party, the Christian Social Union, which is only represented in Bavaria, which is headed by Mr. Uh, Seehofer, uh, that uh, they, they can only go with these two parties, and uh, the CDU-CSU has formed in the past frequently coalitions with the Free Democrats, in various legislative periods, and the Social Democrats have had a very stable uh, government coalition with the Greens. So that is the known fact of both parties that we are talking about, 
in addition to the CDU, CSU, have government experience and they have proved to be re reliable, pragmatic uh, partners that haven't wrecked uh, the boat. The question will be, how do they get along? There are frictions between the uh, Greens in particular and the CSU from Bavaria. There are frictions uh, between the FDP and uh, the Greens on certain issues. The big question that is on the table is uh, for France. Uh, this is probably the worst case scenario because the Free Democrats have repeatedly said they are against a further integration of the Eurozone, meaning they are against uh, a deepening of uh, the uh, common economic and financial policy in the Eurozone, so there may be uh, problems for the future. But apart from that, I would argue that um, this is uh, no uh, catastrophe. Uh, uh, what has happened in Germany, it is uh, an expression of the, uh, the, 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 the voters' uh, opinion with a high participation of over 76%. Uh, the participation went up by 5% over uh, four years ago. And uh, the good thing to know is that the populist danger that had preoccupied us before the Dutch and the French and the Austrian elections was never uh, uh, as big as in those countries because all the established parties in Germany beforehand had declared they will not form a coalition with the AfD. They will isolate them in the opposition, in parliament. Uh, so I would argue uh, there will be a phase of, uh, uh, of uh, new, many new elements in German politics, but nobody should be afraid of Germany becoming an instable uh, uh, partner in any form. And I will leave it at that, and we will have time in our uh, discussion to uh, go into some of these points at uh, greater depth. Thank you very much. Um, at the risk of um, repeating what you've already heard, let me summarize, first of all, very briefly, uh, what happened in the election yesterday. Uh, the election produced a fourth term for Angela Merkel, which makes her uh, one of the few leaders in the Western world who has served in office for such a long period of time. So that is a mark of stability in German politics. It also has the result of moving the second largest party out of a coalition with uh, Mrs. Merkel into the opposition. That is that party's choice. It's the Social Democratic Party. And that party prefers to be in opposition in the future because it felt it has suffered by too close an association with a governing party and was unable to attract voters who were dissatisfied with the direction of German politics. And furthermore, the Social Democratic Party, as a, an expression of its sense of citizenship, said to itself, we don't want a German parliament in which the principal opposition party is a right radical party. And therefore, we would like to be the principal opposition party. The Social Democrats, both on a matter of self-interest and on a matter of civic responsibility, is moving from government into the opposition. Um, the second general result of this election is that the principal governing parties, the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats, have both lost and are weaker in Parliament today than they have been for a long period of time, probably than ever. The third consequence of this election is that there is a proliferation of political parties in the German Parliament. There are now six political parties. There have never been that many parties before. Previous to this election, there were four. Now there are six, and that complicates negotiations among political parties probably considerably. And then obviously everybody has said, the fourth consequence is that a right-wing radical party uh, has come to a level of strength where it is represented at parliament. It has never been in the national parliament in Germany before, although it has been in the state parliaments for several years now. And that party is a party that has many sides to it. I've called it a radical right political party, but uh, it has no great uh, integrity or homogeneity in itself. 
Some parts of it are radical right, some parts of it are merely very conservative, some parts of it are uh, protest voters who are opposed to the political parties that were in power, and we will have to see what that party stands for, if indeed it can be united uh, in its stand in the German parliament. That it is not very united became clear this morning when its chairman resigned from the party uh, immediately after the election, saying she doesn't think she can get along with the other leaders of the party, which is a sign of the fact that the party is going to be troubled in itself. So those are the outcomes. The explanations that I'm going to suggest to you take two forms. There are European explanations that have to do with European politics, and there are specific German explanations. Let me start with the European explanations. There is, as you well know, a major migrant crisis in Europe, a tremendous influx of migrants from Africa and from the Middle East. And the German approach to these migrants was, to a very considerable extent, to welcome them out of a sense of obligation to homeless people in Europe led by Angela Merkel, who famously said when this influx occurred, I think we can manage that. And it came out of a moral principle that was admirable, but out of a neglect of the practical consequences of having, over a two-year period, one million people from the Middle East settling in Germany. The one million people who came to Germany on a per capita basis was not as large as the migration to some other countries in Europe, but in terms of mass and numbers, it was enormous, welcoming a million people in a population of 80 million uh, in Germany. If you translate that into American terms, you know how overwhelming it is, even though actually, on a per capita basis, there was a greater influx of migrants to Hungary and to Sweden than to Germany. But that is crisis number one. How do you assimilate? that many people in a very short period of time, and how do you deal with a German population that becomes very uneasy by the influx of non-German speaking, by and large Muslim populations. The second specific European problem is the stability of the euro, the uh, common currency in which Germany plays a very important role because the German economy is the strongest economy, as the Consul General reminded us. And maintaining the stability of the Europe in countries that are, some of them, particularly in Greece, very weak economically, uh, is a huge challenge. Again, Chancellor Merkel was in the foreground, foreground of those who said, we've got to maintain the Europe. It is such a great achievement, even if some countries uh, in the European Union cannot fully manage it. But the stability of the Europe continues to be an enduring challenge. Uh, the third uh, problem that is specifically European is the relationship between Germany and Turkey. And that is not only a relationship that is specifically German, because uh, there are a very large number of Turkish uh, inhabitants who live in Turkey today, going all the way back uh, 30 years when Germany welcomed what were then called guest workers, many of whom have now become citizens of Turkey. But it is a problem also because Turkey has an enormous population by European standards, and the importance of Turkey economically and politically in Europe is very great, and that hits Germany particularly hard. Now, it has an additional uh, manifestation, and that is that Turkey is in control of one of the paths of migration into Europe, across the Aegean Sea, and Germany has been very anxious to arrange with the Turkish government uh, controls over migration over the Aegean Sea into Turkey, into Germany's rather. And so the relationship with Turkey is for Germany fraught. And it is a relationship between a democratic country, Germany, and an authoritarian country, Turkey, and that makes it very problematical for Mrs. Um, for the German Chancellor. And the final um, German-specific explanation for what has happened uh, in the election is that Germany faces many foreign policy uh, um, challenges, uh, problems of security, problems of participation in international organizations, problems in, of participation in um, international security forces, and some of those problems and some of those challenges have not, not been resolved. So the result is 
that this election damaged Mrs. Merkel's standing and the standing of the Merkel coalition because of the migrant crisis, because of the influx of um, an enormous number of refugees, because of the instability or stability problems of the euro, because of the relationship with Turkey, and because of unresolved foreign policy problems. So the European origins of uh, the decline of support for Mrs. Merkel's coalition. And then there are specific German problems that uh, manifest themselves in this outcome. And one of them is, familiar to the United States, the uneven prosperity within Germany. Yes, the German economy is strong, but it is unevenly distributed, and there are sections of the population extremely dissatisfied with their share of this, uh, of this prosperity. There, is, there are enduring differences between East and West Germany, unresolved differences between these separate parts of the country, which were united by now a fairly long time ago in 1989, but which have not been fully digested yet. The history of East Germany, the history of West Germany, was so different for 40 years that the differences between these two sections of the country are enduring differences that explain, for example, the fact that the AFD, the Alternative for Germany, the Radical Right Party, as I've called it, got twice as many votes in East Germany as in the West, got a share of uh, voting uh, of, of votes of about 25 percent, whereas in the West uh, the share was something closer to 10, 11 percent. And then the third uh, German explanation is that the German automobile industry, as many of you may know, is in a crisis because of the scandals in which the German automobile companies were involved. German automobile companies took a uh, major interest in diesel engines because diesel engines were regarded as environmentally friendly, but the diesel engines that the German manufacturers produced were either deliberately or accidentally uh, guilty of emitting, uh, of, of having em um, emission controls that were inadequate or deliberately designed to be uh, evasive of German and American regulations. And so the German automobile industry is in deep trouble. It's a major industry in Germany. Uh, and there are scandalous relationships between the politicians who knew about this and the industry itself, uh, which practiced this deception. And then um, I might say finally, there are in Germany um, some peculiarities of the electoral system that have resulted in the fact that in an effort to have a perfectly proportional outcome in the election, namely, that the distribution of seats in parliament is in exact proportion to the distribution of votes. That creates mathematical, let me leave it at that, mathematical problems that can only be solved by expanding the, side, the size of the parliament till you achieve proportionality. And that expansion of the size of the parliament has resulted uh, in this election having the largest parliament that Germany has ever had, 709 members. Uh, and if you consider that Germany has a quarter of the population of the United States and is going to have a parliament that's 70% larger uh, than the House of Representatives in the United States. You see one of the peculiar aspects of the German political system that creates certain uh, challenges to the uh, management of a coalition that uh, we have heard is going to be difficult to manage on many other grounds. Um, Concluding point, the Germans have had their election. The election was yesterday. They count the votes fast. We know what the result is. But forming a coalition, as is necessary in Germany, to create a government that can govern together uh, may take between now and Christmas. Um, but we might say in all modest, modesty that forming coalitions that can go go govern a country uh, tends to be very difficult in the United States also. It doesn't go by the same name. Th thank you to Professor Glenenstein for his kind invitation, and also to Professor Lovenberg and Consul General Quelle for their illuminating interventions. I'm not a political scientist um, or a German diplomat, so I will talk to you a little bit about poetry. You probably know uh, of uh, Pablo Neruda the famous Chilean poet. He happened to be also a career diplomat. He was a consul in several places, in Asia, later in Europe. And 
he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1971, and shortly afterwards he wrote a beautiful poem called Libro de las Preguntas, a book of questions, uh, der Buch der Frage, uh, which was published posthumously in 1974, and it was a book composed solely, uniquely, of questions. Questions such as, for instance, why didn't Christopher Columbus discover Spain? Or does smoke talk to clouds? Questions without answers. And at the university, we cherish questions. They are the fuel of thought. And I thought that since I am not a political scientist or a, an expert in German politics, I would throw a few questions to our two eminent guests um, in the hope that it will contribute to spark the debate. And most of all, that I will get many of the goodies that are back there. I've heard that they have great um, gummy birds, official gummy birds. So you can only compete with me if you make as many questions as I'm going to make to our two, two guests. My first question has to do something with teaching. In a moment when Germany is broadly seen across Europe as the master of the continent, and by master I mean mainly as the teacher of the European continent, what can Germany learn from its neighbors nowadays? What were the main lessons learned from the recent Euro crisis that we are probably still suffering in one way or the other? To what extent is the European unification project probably the most formidable uh, democratic experiment in many decades? Uh, is it in danger? <clears throat> In relation to that, what is the homework that is still to be done in Germany? Are we going to see a reactivation of the France-Germany cooperation now um, between Angela Merkel and Macron, as we did when Mitterrand and Helmut Kohl or Jacques Delors in a different sphere uh, had together during the 80s and 90s? Those leaders also had a great counterpart in Southern Europe in the figure of Spanish Prime Minister Felipe González. Who do you think would be an equivalent to González nowadays in European politics in, as a political figure or even as a nation? Who is going to take that role today? How would the German position vis-a-vis -vis the European Union be different depending on whom the CDU has a partner in government? Are the liberals going to push Germany in a different direction that we have seen so far? What can be learned from Eurosceptics? You mentioned that, uh, Consul General Quelle mentioned that they are probably going to isolate the, the most Eurosceptic uh, party right now in the European Parliament, uh, but is there anything to learn from them? <laughs> Chancellor Angela Merkel did teach a lesson in humanitarian values with her courageous and generous handling of the refugee crisis. How did that affect her standing within Germany and in the rest of Europe? Is, the, is that the main factor, this handling of the refugee crisis? Is that the main factor that explains the growth of the far-right far party alternative for Germany in a period of economic and political stability? How is Germany currently handling the refugee situation, both at political and social levels? Is populism only something to be afraid of, or could it become a way of engaging citizens in political debate? And for me, the most important question of all, will the new German government take the initiative for a much needed refoundation of the European Unification Project? So, thank you. Would you like to start off by addressing those questions? And, and I, I do not remember all of them, but... Uh, he has a list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I, I'm uh, of an advantage here. That, uh, and uh, I mean, I understand this should be over in uh, uh, 37 minutes, so this is not a, the first uh, uh, lesson of a pro seminar which will take all semester, I guess. So uh, I will pick out some, some of the uh, questions and I will repeat them because uh, uh, that uh, uh, cannot be expected to bear them in mind. Um, 
unless you insist that I, uh, oh, I, I reply to them in that order. I mean, they, they are all, all valid. Uh, first, I'm, of course, uh, concerned if a, if a Spanish gentleman uh, uh, speaks of Germany uh, in the role of the master or the, or the teacher. I mean, I, I, it has been, uh, maybe there have been communication mistakes on the German side, side but uh, our understanding has been always and, and is to this point. Uh, that we are not a better or a worse than our uh, uh, European Union member state partners, and uh, that this is a uh, union uh, of uh, equals. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, I know the, the Greek press occasionally has uh, uh, treated us as the uh, financial uh, uh, dictator um, but that was, uh, there was one reason which you made uh, very clear for that. Germany felt obliged to defend the euro against uh, speculation of the financial markets. And uh, uh, that may hurt uh, uh, people or countries in a particular situation, but given uh, the whole picture, for instance, uh, this was, if you look at the economic recovery, which has been slow but is undeniably there in the European Union and in the countries that went through the debt crisis, including, including Spain, and if you look at the uh, current strength of uh, the euro uh, uh, policy, which has uh, actually worked. So um, I think uh, at, at hindsight, we should not be um, complaining about that, but even Greece should be um, should be glad that uh, this uh, this happened. The Greek crisis, like uh, all the financial crises within or debt crises within the, some of the member states, are not completely over. But we have great made great uh, progress, and uh, I think it has. Uh, uh, not been because we we felt, uh, be it our financial minister, Mr. Schäuble, or anybody else in the German government, that we should teach these guys who have not uh, paid attention to the school book a lesson. Uh, it, it was that we had the interests of the entire uh, Eurozone um, and the European uh, Union in in mind, uh, so uh, coming to the question that is connected with with that, what were the main lessons learned from the recent euro crisis? Um, uh, to what extent is the European Unification Project probably the first, most formidable democratic experiment of the last few decades in danger? Uh, well, the European Unification, as I see it, uh, remains a project and a process. And there, there, there has sometimes been um, an end uh, discussion or final uh, discussion of, of, of uh, what, what, is, what, is the, what is the end goal of this. But we have to be aware, I believe, these days that uh, maybe we will continually be in this uh, process. The good thing is that uh, if we are in a process, uh, things are uh, moving and they uh, people uh, realize that this is that this organism is alive. Maybe one of the problems of the euro of the of the crisis that we have experienced in the European Union had to do with the fact that uh, one came to a sort of standstill and people were tired of hearing that the European Union has. Uh, been uh, the institution that uh, preserved peace in Europe. Uh, I mean, uh, look at look at other areas of the world. Uh, there are not so many that can look back over 70 years and say 
Well, we have not had wars among our, our members. We have no, not had a war between uh, Germany and Poland. We have not had a war between Germany and France. And if you go to the last century, if you go in particular with regard to German-French relations to the 19th century, I mean, war defined sort of the, 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 uh, the existence of, uh, of either uh, uh, state. Um, it didn't end when uh, finally in 1870, 1871, the German uh, Reich was uh, founded and the, and the, the, the Prussians had, uh, were, were the most uh, uh, important uh, member of, uh, uh, of the uh, of the of the German uh, Reich, the uh, the uh, animosities went on. That is a part of the history. So I mean, the new, there are new movements in in Europe, uh, Germany, uh, Europe. Sorry, uh, parts of Europe, for instance, that make that uh, clear. We may uh, be bored by the fact that there are no wars, but I mean. Uh, there are worse things than to be bored by not having a war. So this uh, this is is very very good, and I think uh, the, and the look at the Schengen area. The the uh, the fact that you can cross borders without having to show your passports, uh, and uh, look at the eurozone advantages of uh, going into a country and not having to change, exchange the currency. And there, there are so many, many reasons. But of course, this does not mean that everything was good. There was over-regulation in Brussels that also Germans uh, became concerned about. Uh, and you had to explain, well, why uh, on trade uh, issues, for instance, is it important to regulate the size of a tractor seat or the, um, the, the component factors of this or that? Uh, so that you can easily uh, compare uh, things that go across uh, the borders. I think, uh, yes, we can, coming back to one of the other questions that you have, we can learn from uh, every uh, weakness or uh, mistake, and we should actually, because nobody has, especially if you assume that you are in a continuous process, uh, that you have uh, reached the final wisdom and this is the only truth. Nobody uh, believes that that, that is, is part of the, uh, is part of the, the, the game that this, um, uh, 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 this should be uh, going on. And the final point I would like to make coming to your question, Chancellor Angela Merkel did teach a lesson in humanitarian, the lesson again, <laughs> in humanitarian values with her courageous and generous handling of the refugee crisis. How did that affect her standing within Germany and in the rest of Europe? Uh, the, the basic question connected with that is um, to what extent can you implement values as a nation state uh, against uh, the declared uh, will and intention of other nation states that are together with you in a union of values, which the Uni European Union claims to be. And I have compared that in talks that I've given since September 2015, when the uh, uh, migrant crisis began to uh, began to escalate to the extent that you describe with one million uh, refugees. That only came then because we had already had hundreds of thousands from Syria since uh, 2013. So if it had stayed at the level of 2013, 2014, with 200,000, 250,000, we might not have the problem that we have today. But the situation escalated in, uh, in uh, uh, the fall of 2015. And I think the only decision possible, I know that I'm in, uh, uh, that there is a growing opposition to that view. I believe the only uh, position possible for Germany in that situation, for many reasons, foremost historical, was to take the course that uh, Angela Merkel courageously uh, took. Uh, but this was a decision foremost for us. When we said, okay, we can manage, we, we are schaffen das, 
She was only talking about Germany, and she said, said believing in the German uh, people and in the German voter, you many volunteers, and there were hundreds of thousands who assisted when 10 to 15,000 people arrived in one day at Munich train station. Without these vol volunteers, this would not have happened, uh, would not have been possible, but it worked, and there's still a sufficient majority of the German population, despite these elections yesterday, who uh, believe this was a good thing to do. So these values were uh, implemented in Germany, but they, there is resistance to them, not only in, in, in Hungary, uh, you said per capita, uh, Hungary took in more in Germany. That was for a brief period in, in that uh, initial uh, phase the case, but when Germany accepted the uh, thousands stranded in Hungary, Hungary was very happy to get rid of them. And today, they don't even have 10,000 refugees in, in Hungary. I think the numbers are more in the three digits than in the four digits. So we have a problem in that respect with our European Union neighbors, with Hungary, with, the, with Poland, with uh, the Slovak Republic, with the Czech Republic. Uh, and uh, we cannot implement against their will. And that actually was a problem in the elections. If the European solidarity had been higher, uh, and if uh, Angela Merkel could have implemented what she had promised the voters, that the other European Union members will share our, our part and take more refugees, if the redistribution had worked, this element of critique would have fallen away. People would have seen, well, actually, I mean, one can argue that we had to take them for humanitarian reasons, but now the others are doing uh, their share. This is, I see, part of the political problem that Angela Merkel uh, faced. And um, what does this mean for the European Union as a whole? I mean, I've compared this uh, two, I know that is not one on one uh, uh, correct, uh, but I think it's valid to make an attempt. I've compared this actually with the situation uh, during the civil war in the United States. Maintaining uh, the cohesion of uh, the values of the, v of the Union uh, and maintaining the uh, United States as such versus the implementation of values, uh, namely the abolition of uh, slavery. There were compromises that w had to be dealt with. And if you just equate uh, abolition of uh, slavery as a value with the value of upholding uh, the principles of the Geneva Refugee uh, uh, Convention and the uh, Constitution of Germany, the, uh, the uh, right to uh, be granted political asylum on the one hand with the, uh, uh, the, the cohesion of the European Union which is at stake if we tried to be the master of the Union and tell everybody well you may not your people may not accept it but you have to ha you have to take 100,000 refugees then we would sacrifice the cohesion of the European Union that could not be implemented. In the end, I would argue, and this may be a very sober note, that if we are confronted with a choice, cohesion or values, even Germany uh, would say, okay, I think we have to go for cohesion because the European Union and the potential that it has is in the end more valuable for us than what we can contribute to the world in sharing uh, the problems that uh, people from uh, 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 countries far away or, or not so far away uh, have. So that shows you the historic, historical and political and sociological dimension, I believe, of the issue that was, uh, that was uh, at stake. And the final sentence uh, on that, uh, it has not uh, contributed to an excellent standing of uh, Angela Merkel in, um, in the world. It has, has also contributed to an excellent standing of Angela Merkel 
in uh, uh, a large part of the European Union and to this day uh, uh, a large part of a population in Germany who normally would not have voted for her and her party, who would have rather voted for the Greens and the SPD. She has moved her party to uh, be beyond the center to the left in many, uh, many respects and has taken up issues that other parties would have uh, uh, taken in, which has been criticized, but I think it was a clever uh, move uh, producing uh, to some extent, the result that we saw yesterday. Thank you. Jerry, did you want to take just maybe Let's a minute? Give or the people okay, I, I certainly agree. So I will be roaming with the mic here. Um, anyone who would like to ans ask a question, please do raise your hand. And then briefly, um, Bruce, I don't know if you could just hold up. We ha it, basically, once you've asked a question, you are eligible to go back to where my colleague, Bruce Nottingham Spencer, is. There is one of the Germany Making Choices t-shirts. Here you have the, the, the large version here. Uh, we also have notebooks with pens or pens. And lest I forget, this is your opportunity to get official German government gummy bears from the Foreign Office or the Auswärtiges Amt. This is rare, believe me. Um, you, I don't even know if you want to open these, but I'll leave that up to, to you. Um, so I'll be coming around, and then I thought perhaps um, after you've had a chance, I, I would invite all three of our speakers to address the questions as you feel it's relevant for your particular expertise. And then perhaps um, towards the end then, uh, each of you could maybe just make a, a concluding remarks of a minute or two. So I already saw, uh, here, I'll just hand off uh, the microphone here is Robert, correct? So with the situation with uh, former AFD member Petri leaving the AFD in parliament, um, just more information on the reasons behind that. And also, do you think that might cause an effect on in parliament with movement since there is six parties? You know, she's an independent, I believe, now. Do you think that might affect other people's views and their movement from parties, possibly? But thank you. Uh, I think you want to start? I've spoken. Please. I, I think it's hard to say. Um, I think she concluded rather early that she wouldn't be able to get along uh, with the other leaders of the party. And uh, she will be, as you rightly say, she'll be an independent. Uh, whether other people will follow in the party will follow her or not is an open question. I just take it as a symptoms of the fact of the fact that that party will have difficulty maintaining cohesion. It it represents too many different things, all the way from general opposition to extreme right wing radicalism to, in some cases, um, kind of latter day Nazi uh, attitudes. So it's a, it's a heterogeneous group. It may not hold together. Okay. I, um, how do you think moving forward the, um, the win by the AFD is going to affect Germany's role in the European Union? I don't think it will have any uh, effect on uh, our position in the European Union. That's what I said. Uh, it will not form uh, a role, have a role in in government. Um, the uh, Frau Petra's uh, decision will um, is the first of an unraveling that I I see, and uh, people will become very fast disillusioned with uh, what the party can achieve in um, uh, in uh, a part in the Bundestag. Uh, people won't l listen to any recommendations they might have on the principles of uh, uh, European Union uh, or Eurozone uh, membership. They will try to, try to obstruct uh, uh, government business uh, along those, uh, on, the, on these issues, but they will not succeed. But I'll say one other thing. I mean, they will have rights in the parliament to speak, uh, to take, take positions, to block unanimous consent on, uh, on certain measures, so they can be, in that sense, procedural troublemakers in Parliament, but it will not affect policy, and they hold no office. 
what kind of opposition can we expect from the Social Democratic Party now that they are no longer a part of the main coalition? Um, for instance, um, with regard to European Union politics, if Martin Schulz, who is an experienced European uh, politician, uh, uh, keeps his, which is his intention, but the party will still have to decide on that officially, uh, then we can expect um, a s strong support of a more uh, open uh, uh, line towards uh, going the Macron uh, course in um, financial uh, uh, politics in the in the eurozone, and I, I find that very interesting that the that in uh, that the SPD then can play can play a very constructive. A role with regard to uh, the European Union, not against uh, the CDU, which would always go along with that, uh, but uh, against the uh, the junior partner in the coalition, the Free Democratic Party. On a similar note, I'm wondering if you could speak to these initial processes as they form the coalition between the CDU. CSU, FDP, and the Greens, if there's anything we can expect, or how that actually is carried forward? It's a very complicated process, forming a coalition, which is why it may well take several months uh, to, to achieve a result. Uh, the first step probably is uh, Mrs. Merkel to assure herself that the SPD really doesn't want to work with her, uh, which means that in the beginning she will consult all the parties, but when it becomes clear that she's going to have to deal with three, part, three parties altogether, um, then there are very arduous negotiations over specific <laughs> policy issues where the Free Democrats differ from the Christian Democrats and where the Green Party differs from the Free Democrats. You can look at it this way. The Greens are a relatively left-wing party, an environmentally sensitive, idealistic political party. The Free Democrats are, I would say, a little closer to a um, right-wing Republican party in the United States. So that's one big difference. Then within the CDU-CSU, you actually have two political parties. You have the Bavarian wing called the CSU, and you have the CDU, which is in the rest of the country. And the Bavarian wing is not only very conservative, but is beleaguered at the present time because it lost more more votes uh, in the election yesterday than the CDU did. So the Bavarian Party is going to tug at Mrs. Merkel to the right, and the Free Democrats are going to tug at her from a free enterprise point of view, and the Green Party is going to tug at her from an environmental uh, left-wing point of view. And that means making uh, coalition agreements and making compromises is going to take a long period of time. The end result is going to be um, which is a German practice that's most, most amazing, a treaty among these parties, which may take 100 pages, 200 pages, in which they commit themselves in advance to certain compromises on policy issues. So that's a long answer. Anyone else? Yeah, uh, I would like to add, if you take, for instance, the refugee issue, the Free Democratic Party has stated that they want to have clear differentiation between uh, people who are fleeing from uh, a war zone, uh, political asylum seekers, and people who uh, claim uh, to, uh, who, who just come to Germany because they are in economic misery in their, their countries. They want to uh, do everything possible to have this latter group not reaching uh, Germany. So that is very close to the position that also the CSU has had. Uh, so there will be a demand for a ceiling and the, of, of uh, immigration for, for, this, for this group or they will be targeting only selected groups that, that can benefit the, uh, be of benefit to the German economy and uh, uh, the German uh, population growth uh, issues that we, we, we need. Uh, they will uh, be in, in a conflict with the Greens, who have been the most outspoken on a very uh, open um, uh, 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 refugee policy 
at the federal level, but not at the uh, lender level, at the state level, or the, the, the mayor's level. For instance, there are conservatives within the Green Party, Mr. Palmer, the mayor of Tübingen, who has spoken the same language as the CSU, and Mr. Uh, Kachman, who has all also been a very, uh, has all also stated that maybe the the the, the line of uh, the the party headquarters in Berlin being taken on that is not the, the wisest. So it will also be a question of how the positions within the parties uh, uh, play out without within the Green Party. And I would not be surprised that we end up with, for instance, with regard to the refugee policy, and that would. Uh, take away also the the uh, uh, that will take out would take out some followers behind the AFD. That now the, in the even with the Greens in government, there will be a more restrictive uh, refugee policy in the new uh, uh, parliament. I have one more question um, related to this other new party that has erupted in, in parliament, the De Linke, right, which was yeah. not uh, present in parliament four years ago. And now, all of a sudden, we have another new party, apart from AFD, that has not been mentioned. What's the uh, placement of their, uh, what's their position on some of the key issues? And are they going to play a role at all? Which party now? The De Linke. De Linke. Um, They've been in Parliament before. If you're talking so about the it, left party, mm -hmm. it has been in Parliament. So what was the, the other new party that uh, the FTP is uh, new again? They were out in the last legislative mm -hmm. uh, uh, period. Yeah, yeah they were funded in 2007. But, yeah. Uh -huh. So the the two new parties are the FTP and the AFD. Okay. And for the FTP, new uh, after a lapse of one legislative okay. period. Mm -hmm. But the Linke has been in, in, in Parliament. And that position has been, uh, well, uh, uh, more Russia-friendly uh, line than, than uh, uh, that of the, of the government. Uh, 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 they have been very critical of some of the Eurozone uh, uh, politics of uh, the Merkel government and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. the, the, the left party, so-called Die Linke, is a successor to what was called the Party of Democratic Socialism, and that in itself was a successor to the Communist Party in the German Democratic Republic. So one version or another of that left-wing party has been in Parliament since 1990. And it's precluded from participation at the national level uh, in government. So it just plays a role in Parliament, in the national Parliament. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, thank you for those excellent questions. I now have at least six people on my list, and I see we only have 10 more minutes. So I'll ask both the, um, those asking questions and our speakers to be as succinct as possible here. Oh boy, trying to be succinct. You partially answered a question that I was gonna ask. Um, you know, as an American reading about the sexual assaults on, in New Year's Eve, on New Year's Eve in Cologne and Stuttgart and Hamburg and- Last I, year. No, no, not last year, in 2015, okay. uh, December 2015. I was shocked, I mean like really shocked because it really brought up some issues of, of like, as an American and having been to Western Europe many times, I felt like women can often move around rather freely and for for there to be the arab game uh taharush gamai i uh, pardon my arabic is not good you know that, that they were surrounded that women were surrounded and assaulted was a, was a very deep shock kind of existential shock <laughs> to me because um and then when the police commissioner said that they were mostly people from Algeria and Morocco, so those are, you addressed that they were economic refugees. Um, I, I guess what I'm saying is that I am not a supporter of uh, Alternative for Deutschland, but I totally, I understand that this party does not get created out of a vacuum, that there are real problems with taking in so many refugees, and there are real problems that interact with, uh, you know, Salafism and Wahhabism, and also with Turkey's move from being a secular state to a more Islamic st uh, Islamist state. So my question for you is, sometimes 
non-nutty parties learn something good from nutty parties and they adopt it. And for example, what you said that they're already possibly taking out, trying to curb the economic refugees. I guess what, what in, a, in a beautiful, beautiful scenario, what would Merkel learn from the AFD? The pos you know, what would she, it's one thing to, to be humanitarian and say, come on in, but it's another thing not to make sure that the women in your country are safe in a public space. These, these were isolated uh, incidences on a, a formerly unknown uh, <coughs> scale, and the lesson uh, that already the uh, government uh, took from that was that uh, people um, uh, who uh, committed uh, crimes should be uh, repatriated uh, at a uh, faster space uh, than uh, previously possible. There, there are problems with that, but that's the basic policy. And there, there's nothing for Angela Merkel uh, to learn from the AFD along those lines. Most of the things have, or most of the steps necessary have already been, been taken. That's another reason why uh, it's uh, to some extent not understandable uh, that the AFD was so successful. Um, so with new coalitions forming after this recent election and the fact that there's six parties instead of four now, what does this look like for Germany as the role of paymaster in the EU and Europe? Well, I are, we, are we the paymaster? I, I should say that um, we have briefly addressed this issue of Zahnmeister yeah. as a sort of, you know, a, a one-time term. Um, okay. And the question is, you know, can, can the, the soft, you know, to what extent uh, might this affect uh, perhaps soft power monetary policy um, within the EU? That, that would be my interpretation of that. Well, I think it's an example of the kind of compromises that have to take place among the parties uh, in the new coalition and probably will be, in some specific detail, uh, parts of the coalition treaty that they've got to work out. So there's, it's impossible to give an answer to it right now. It's obviously an important issue. Uh, and it, it, it's got to be a matter of compromise in some detail uh, before the government can be formed. So uh, what's uh, CSU and CDU and also AFD's opinion about Russian involvement and also Assad regime in Syria? Like if Russia, Syria and Iran could finish the war, could that uh, ease the tension of refugee crisis? Uh, yes, uh, if, the, if Syria is pacified, then people would uh, uh, return, especially those who had excellent uh, jobs there and who were just forced out due to the uh, situation. It will ease the pressure um, uh, on, uh, Europe, on, on European and German politics. That's correct. Okay. So um, three more questions here. Unfortunately, I won't be able to take any other questions uh, given our time constraints here. Do you still have a question? Um, I'm wondering if groups like AFD, would you say that they're uh, contained within certain demographics? And if so, will they largely stay in certain age groups? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. Um, and it's, it, it is so far difficult to answer. But by and large, the AFD appeals uh, to voters who have uh, less education uh, than average, that is, who are high school graduates, but um, haven't had experience at uh, educational level above high school. It is also a party that appeals, obviously, to people who have um, not been rewarded in the increasing prosperity in the country. So far as age groups are concerned, the party is stronger in middle age groups than it is among the youngest people and among the oldest people. That's the general answer to it. So um, it's a party that does have appeal to particular sociological and age groups not completely across the board. Okay, so uh, concerning the AFD and its new, uh, its rise in prominence in the last election, and um, 
So the, the AFD run like, I think, 13% of the popular vote. And obviously, there are a lot of people in the AFD who are, you know, they're just the crazy ones who aren't, who shouldn't, be take, who shouldn't really be paid attention to. But when it concerns the protest voting aspect of the AFD and um, the ones who were just dissatisfied with the way the government was being run, is, do you think that the, the new government, Angela Merkel, however she wants to run it, do you think that she has a way, any ideas of bringing those protest voters back into the fold in a way, back to norm, the, see it, the major parties? Or do you think they're just going to try and see like if the AFD will splinter apart eventually? No, she's going to take it seriously. She's going to, and she has said she will, take seriously the kinds of objections and dissatisfactions that those voters represent. I think she's going to take it very seriously because that party grew up clearly grew because of dissatisfaction, certain aspects particularly of economic policy, but also with migrant policy. Um, incidentally, the strength of that party fluctuates a great deal. One of the reasons the opinion polls, by and large, underestimated the strength of the party in the election was that um, six months ago, the party had half that strength, so far as the polls were concerned. Then it fluctuated upwards. And at the present time, the polls um, were reasonably accurate, but not quite at the level. Furthermore, there was that big east-west difference. The party, as I said already, uh, got about um, 23, 24 percent of the votes in the eastern states, uh, and something like 10 percent of the votes, something like that, in the western states. So there's a lot of fluctuation in party strength. But if you want to concentrate on the question, does Angela Merkel take it seriously? Yes, she does. Yeah, I agree. Previously, you guys spoke a lot about cohesion within the European Union and wanted to um, continue that. And with the Brexit decision of the spring, how is Germany going to fight for cohesion moving forward? We, d we don't see any further unraveling of the uh, European Union. That, I think, is a misperception, which is quite widespread in this country, with which I d completely disagree. Uh, the decision of the United Kingdom is a unique decision uh, from which uh, mostly Great Britain and the British people will uh, uh, suffer and be hurt. Uh, of course, we all respect that, but I lived in London four years. They were never, uh, the Brits were never in the European Union with the heart and mind to the same extent as uh, people from the continent. Um, I, I do know we have a couple other interested parties here. I will first just ask, uh, I know that the Consul General actually needs to hop in his rental car and drive to Grinnell for his second event tonight. Um, Herbert, how much time do you have at this point? Uh, yeah, uh, not uh, knowing the road, depending <laughs> on my navy, and uh, which tells me, uh, because I have to step uh, into my bed and breakfast to get my keys. Uh, I have to, uh, I have two min minutes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I know some of you still have questions. My apologies that we weren't able to take all questions. Um, for everyone in Germany and the world, uh, just like to let you know that we're gonna uh, postpone our discussion of the German export economy and such fascinating topics such as uh, uh, cap, uh, capital goods, and we're going to uh, spend Wednesday talking about the post-election issues as well. So any questions that you weren't able to answer or ask today, we'll, um, I'll do my best <laughs> to um, answer them on Wednesday. And then, I don't know, do any, would any of you like to offer just one or two concluding remarks? Yeah, I would just like to say that I've tremendously enjoyed uh, the depth of your questions. Uh, I wish uh, the students here in the room all the best for their uh, careers. Uh, the German learners I've already encouraged uh, to learn German in this part of the country with the large uh, presence of German, German, American companies is a wise decision. It puts you in an advantageous spot over those competitors who don't speak uh, German. Uh, all the best and thank you to everybody who has joined us this afternoon. Thank you.